What's going on, guys? JR Sports Media back at it again for another episode of the Smack Talk Podcast. I'm here with Kevin Mesnick, Jonathan Weathers, as well as Logan Gadula, current defender of the Charleston Battery, as well as former 13th overall pick in the 2019 MLS Select Draft by the FC Cincinnati. Logan, what's going on, my man? I'm good. How are you guys? I'm just chilling here, trying to make it through the quarantine, <laughs> trying not to be bored all the time. Try not to be bored. You know, I'm not very athletic myself. I look at soccer yeah. players. I don't know how you run all the time. Logan, what are you doing in quarantine? You know, I know they make you run like a motherfucker in practice. Oh. What are you doing right now to stay up in shape for soccer? Yeah. Um, the first couple of weeks when it was bad, when we couldn't leave that, that house, we were doing Zoom meetings like this, just workouts, abs, a lot of abs. In <laughs> chemistry right there. You know what I'm saying? And then they'd send us, uh, like, workouts to do, go run four miles, which – those always suck. <laughs> the running part sucks. When there's a ball involved, it doesn't suck as bad. <laughs> but uh, we just got cleared to do like small group trainings this past week or last week we started them. But I mean, right now it's only like you train with your roommates on the field and the little square and the rest of the team's there, but they're all in their own little square. So it's progress, but <laughs> Even not, with soccer not. fanfare, you guys don't touch the ball with your hands, so. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? The other day they told us we couldn't head the ball because the sweat would get on it. No way. Yeah. <laughs> Can't get no breaks out here. I know, right? Man. So basically, we're just running <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. And how, how are – you're in Charleston right now, right? Yeah. My, I got a couple boys that go to school down there. I went to school down there. They're done oh, yeah. There. They're all partying and stuff like that and all on the beach. So yeah. It seem like they're too, too tight or strict on it down there. Is that yeah. So this past week, like it's been real loose. Like one of the beaches open. I heard some of the bars open. They said like one of the, one of my boys went to the bar and they said like, if you had a patio, if they had a patio, you could open the bar and there would be people everywhere. Like they was yeah, absolutely open. Yeah. So, I mean, there's more to do now. Like I don't have to wear, I've never, I haven't worn a mask this whole time. I've gone where I wanted to go. So. Oh, you one of those guys. Yeah. <laughs> You said it to you said it to the world now. We know. Stay away from Logan. Oh dang, I didn't mean to say it like that. I was at, uh, main, main reason why I asked you was because he's trying to get me to go down there right now. I was like, is that a yeah. no weather's oh, yeah. nice though? Weather's nice. Weather's nice. Hey. Beach is nice. So Logan, you're from Connecticut. Uh we all went to the University of Hartford. Me and Kevin just graduated, but John actually graduated two years ago. Uh being from Connecticut, you know, I'm from New York City, Queens. I actually don't know the sports scene in Connecticut. Can you just yeah. tell me a little bit about, you know, growing up in Connecticut, playing soccer, and now obviously playing at a professional level? Yeah, so I actually grew up in – so I lived in, like, two towns growing up. But, like, everyone, you just play, like, every sport. It wasn't, like – the area that we lived in, you didn't really see a lot of people coming out of that area playing professional sports. Like, some – you know, like, some places are known for certain sports, like, to develop – talent in those kind of sports yeah. but I get like my area it wasn't really a big sports thing like you just played whatever uh, you played all what of them, town you know? are you from? I'm from Colchester Colchester yeah. man that's yeah. like so I'm from New Haven so I'm from yeah. like the densely populated part Colchester's exactly. out man. yeah you got so, a yeah. populated part of Connecticut I got it <laughs> right <laughs> what are you I mean about? it's 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 way bigger than Colchester but Wait, so Logan, yeah. your town's not known for a lot of sports. You played soccer. Yeah. What was your inspiration into getting into soccer and obviously putting in that extra preparation that separated you from, yeah. you know, the bunch? So um, my mom actually worked at Workout World, like a Workout World, and they sure. had an indoor soccer field. So I was two years old, actually. And my grandma ran the daycare there. And I, like, after – because I would be there all the time, I'd get sick of just, like, sitting in the daycare. I just would go out and – go on the field and like one of the coaches like yeah you can play with us and so I'd be playing with like kids that are four and five because that's when it really started so like ever since I learned how to walk I learned how to kick the ball at the same time so like that's just where like the love for the game started because my dad was just a guy that played every sport like in college he played basketball baseball soccer but like because soccer started off so early for me and I think like now especially for people our age and people even younger than us like we're told now, like, you have to pick a sport early and stick with it if you want to play at the highest level, which sucks because all the sports really benefit you. Like, if I play basketball, it might benefit how I play soccer. Definitely. So it kind of sucks in that sense. But, I mean, it worked out for me. I'm not saying, like, everyone should do that. But 
it, like it just was a thing that I fell in love with right away. And I did play other sports. It just like if they didn't really compare for me. Like when you find something you're really good at and it, it, it's fun to do, you really you, I stuck with it really early on. Right. Yeah. We, that, with that kind of being said, I know you said that Colchester, Connecticut, not really a hot hot bed for yeah. talent or basketball talent or football <laughs> talent. But anyway, I'm not going to bash Connecticut right now. <laughs> but with that being said, who did you kind of model your play after? Who did you – who were you kind of inspired by to, to, to keep it going? So I was a big uh, Cristiano Ronaldo guy in the beginning. There we go. So, yeah, you know, yeah. So I was a big fan. And man, Manchester United was my favorite team. And then he left for Real Madrid and then – Manchester is blue, baby. Stop playing. Yeah. They are blue now. <laughs> they are blue. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, they are on blue. my podcast talking about no red man. <laughs> Manchester <laughs> is blue now. They are, but <laughs> that United, I, had to, I had to stick with them. But hey. I, I'm, a, I'm a messy guy, a Neymar guy. I just think – like Cristiano Ronaldo, he's like a LeBron James, very physically gifted, will be able to play for probably till he's 40. But, like, the way Messi and Neymar play, like, they're entertainers at the highest level. Like, in soccer, sports are entertainment. I just think, like, the game comes so easy to them, and that's how, what I modeled my game after. It was more like if you play smart, like, you won't have to play as hard. People will be working harder, and you can just play smarter. So that was, like, a big thing for me. It's just, like, their IQ, like, just reading the game, learning the game, just watching a lot of the game it helped me a lot. So was just, that like, kind of being – with that kind of being said, I know you said you're a fan of both uh, Messi and Ronaldo. Yeah. You can't be on the fence like that. No, no. Not, not no, even I, a minute. Who are you taking to score a goal? Messi. I left Ronaldo. Woo! I mean, I Woo! would have took Ronaldo, but when he left United, I was heartbroken. Okay. Is this a personal vendetta? It's a per yeah, yeah, it's personal. Okay. okay. It's personal. It's per I also <laughs> think his game changed once he left. It's more just goals, and that was about it. The number. Okay. He was a numbers guy. Yo, Logan, just adding on the, you know, the early fundamentals of your game, what was it like to play at Bacon Academy High School, you know? Obviously, yeah. you're trying to get a college scholarship. I believe you played at uh, Minnesota, correct? Oh, for? For college. Wake, Wake Forest. Forest. Wake Forest. My apologies. You play at Wake Forest. Obviously, yeah. a big-time, you know, athletic school. They got a lot of, a lot of money, a lot, big department. What is it like playing in, at this high school? You know, are your coaches telling you, Logan, you got a good chance of getting the scholarship. You know, they're pushing you more and more. What was, like, the process like at this high school? Okay, so in Connecticut, so there was, like, this uh, – for U.S. soccer, there was an academy, which is, like, the next level to be in, in the MLS or, like, a professional. So they would have MLS teams that would have their own academies. And then there would be certain states that had their own academies. So, like, that was the biggest club – the biggest clubs to play for in each state. So, like, that, you would go, say, we play the league, and then once the league's over in the summer or the, the winter, we'd go to a showcase. And those had every college coach there, every D1 coach, every D2 coach, wow. every D3 coach. So you would walk into one of your games, a bunch of games going on, and you'd see, like, every, all the coaches wearing their jerseys or their shirts, UConn, St. John's, Louisville, like, Florida, whatever you want, maybe. So – they made a rule, like when I was in, a freshman in high school, where you can only play one or the other. So you played academy or you played high school soccer. You couldn't do both at the same time. Mm. So they made that rule after my freshman year. And it didn't implement till junior year. But so freshman year I played, I started on varsity. There was a few kids from my school that actually played academy with me. I was fortunate enough to be like the only one that played, started on varsity. But... I had conversations with my coaches on my academy team and they basically told me the rule that was being implemented and said like, this is your best chance to, to go to that next level. Like obviously there's sacrifices when you play a professional sport. So I missed a lot of the stuff that you get to enjoy in high school. Like I wish I could have done both. I would have done both for sure. But I missed homecoming dances. I missed all of that, but in the end it was worth it. But there was a time where they're just like, here, here's, here's the tea. Like, you got to do one or the other. And yeah. we think this is the best option for you. And, I, I mean, I took that and I ran with it. So that must, be, that must be pretty crazy being in high school and being good at a sport, but you're not playing for your school. Yeah. I, yeah. I've had a buddy that had that happen to him with the role. And I think he played academy at another yeah. uh, team that I can't think of now. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, what what's that like? Because I remember for him, it was like he was light years better than a lot of people. Like yeah. People on the he wasn't playing for the school, so. Yeah. What 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 sucked was that the team was really good. Like we had like if Colchester was good at anything at the time, it was soccer. Like we had a lot of people that went and played academy, my grade older. So it just sucks because when you do live in a small town, like you know everyone in your high school. So yeah. when you play a sport, people know what you're doing, who you are, and mm-hmm. it's just like a very community based thing. Like everyone rallies around that sport whenever it's happening. Like I went to a lot of basketball games with my boys play on the basketball team. And like that's something cool because you go into school the next day, like, oh, did you see so and so do this? Blah blah blah. So it, it, it sucked missing out on all that. And, like, it, you wish you could be a part of it. And they actually did really well, which was, like, like, I was happy for them. It wasn't like I was bitter that I wasn't able to play and they did really well. It just shows that, like, all the talent that was there soccer-wise. And, you, you like, we would hear a lot, like, oh, if you guys played, if you played, like, we would have won the state championship every year because they made it to the state yeah. championship two, two years in a row. They didn't win either either of them, but they they were good enough to make it there. So right, right. Seemed like you had your eyes kind of you know looking forward to the future, and I mean that ended up working out well for you playing D one at Wake Forest. So I mean, yeah. what was the what was the transition like? I mean, obviously the way that you explained academy, you're playing in front of all these coaches, so hmm. probably were playing with some of the best of the best. But I mean, is it any different than playing D one once you step up to that college level? Yeah, uh, it's def- it's different in the sense that I went to a conference in the ACC that was hands down the best conference in the country like every year like every team in the in the conference would be ranked either in the top 50 or top 25 depending on the year every every team and they would say like the conference that conference tournament's the hardest to win it's harder to win than the NCAA tournament so it's just it it, the level is it's different it's a different style of play because it's more physical. Like you're playing against, like you could come in at us. I came in at 17 years old and I'm playing against guys that are 22 years old, you know? Right. Yeah. Like the level of playing Academy is like more technical. Like it just slowed down a lot for you. Like you're just learning how to play. It's all development. Then when you go and you have to win games and it gets more physical, it's different. But when I, when you go to Wake Forest, like in Academy, I'm, I'm the big man on campus. I'm the, I've always been that the best player on my team, but then you go there and you've been you're playing with guys that, oh, I was the best player on my team, right? So it's just like it makes you better. Like our training sessions, it was, I think for at, at a college college standpoint, like our team training, it was very professional. So Logan, take me through this. I'm just adding on to this question. You know, <laughs> you're at the showcase. You know, you, there's any college coast that you could probably imagine. You say Louisville, you know, Florida, St. John's. What makes yeah. you want to go to Wake Forest? What what stands out about Wake Forest that defers you from all these other colleges? Because obviously you were, you know, a highly recruited defenseman. Probably mm-hmm. could have went anywhere you wanted. Why did you choose Wake Forest? That's a good question. But so I think I watched my first college soccer game when I was like a fresh, like an eighth grade or seventh grade. I would always watch UConn and then I was like, oh, it was on TV, the NCAA tournament. And uh it was the first time I ever watched the watched it on TV, like any other team besides UConn. And I watched it because my coach at the time had played for Ohio State. So Ohio State was in the final and they were playing Wake Forest. And I watched them play and I was like, wow. Like I was just enamored by it all. Like I was the way they played, the style, like it was just so different than any other team I had seen play. Just like the pos- possession they played and just the way they played that I was like, in that moment, I was like, that's that's my dream school for soccer. For soccer I didn't know anything about the school I just watched a soccer game and I was like wow like that's <laughs> I like their colors I, I mean I like their style <laughs> I was like it was just like <laughs> straight on from there but like once you start getting into the recruiting process you realize like oh maybe that might be out of my league like when certain teams start calling you're like oh maybe this is my level but well, that was the dream possible it's not really clear cut, you know, the NBA, you know, you get, you get a, on a mixtape, you go viral, you know, scouts start looking at you, you go to a college, whatever you want to do. The NFL, the same way, you, you're a five-star recruit. But, you know, in soccer, it's it's like a gray area. You, you know, for me Definitely. personally, I don't know how the process works. You know, yeah. if I have a friend that plays college soccer, I may think that's cool. But if he's good enough to play professional soccer, I wouldn't understand, you know, the process that you go about, you know, yeah. in order to solidify yourselves under those realms. Can you just give the audience just a brief, you know, understanding of what the process was of, you know, 
getting to the school, obviously highly ranked, you know, Wake Forest, yeah. but obviously, and then, and then going into the select draft, being selected 13th overall, not easy to do. How were you able to transition yourself after college to prepare yourself to become a professional player? So, a lot, so I wanted like, first and foremost, I wanted to get my degree just cause that's something my mom had always talked about. That's something I want to do for her. Got to make mama proud. Yeah. And I'm first generation college graduate. So it's like a big accomplishment for me. I mean, it's a great school. Like who, who wouldn't want a degree from there? Exactly. But um, I had a really good junior year. Um, thought I could have the possibility of going, leaving early. But um, in the end, one more semester couldn't hurt. And I was able to get my degree, even though a lot of people that go to the draft their senior year aren't able to. But my sophomore year, when I started starting a lot and playing a lot of minutes, I grew as a player and my coach came up to me after that fall and said, I, I think you should do summer school and try to get all your classes out of the way because I think there's a real possibility for you to get drafted high in the draft and, and go on to play professional soccer. And I mean, at the time, like, I wasn't focused on anything like that. I was just focused on playing and winning and I had a lot of good players around me. So I knew what I was capable of, but I didn't ever think that high yet. Like it wasn't in my future for me at the time when I was a sophomore. So, but I did all that stuff and it comes around and you see like players on your team that you think are really good or at their position. And sometimes you, they don't fit into the MLS standards. Some positions like they want European players or they don't want college players for certain positions. And you see a lot of good players not make it that you thought would. And then you look at yourself and you're like, maybe I'm not, I'm not cut out for that. Um, I actually came into college as a, a attacker. And when I got there as a freshman, they thought I was good enough to be in the starting 11, but the position I played, we had a junior that was a captain already, probably the best player in that position in the whole country, whole country. So I wasn't going to sit there two years and not play. So they thought it'd be a good idea for me to switch to defense to right back. And, at first, I was like, I've never defended in my life. Like, <laughs> I don't defend. I don't want to score goals. <laughs> That's the fun part. But now looking back on it, that might be have been the biggest thing for me that helped me get drafted and drafted so high to where I feel good about the level I'm at. Because as an attacker, it's really hard to make it in the MLS. And to go that high in the draft, that's – they look for defenders, for college defenders that, that they know are, could be reliable. So that helped me a lot. Like that was a big move and I don't regret that at all now. So that was probably the biggest thing. It's like switching positions and then you go through a process of, you don't know if you're gonna make it to the combine. So then I went to another pre-combine that I was invited to. During that, I realized that I got invited to the actual combine. And then when you get to the combine, it's, it's stressful. It's it, like, depending on who you ask, it's a good experience or it's a bad experience. For me, it was fine. But like, you could feel the anxiety in the room. Like, 100%. you're in a hotel room with someone else. You walk out of the hotel room and you're walking to go get lunch or something. And you see every coach, every owner, every general manager of every team. And you just, you don't say anything. You just walk. You just you think about everything that's going on, agents everywhere talking to players. That's crazy. And I, like with me specifically, you could feel the energy with the people that you're with. Like you would have interviews and I was lucky enough to have a lot of interviews, like one of the most players to have interviews with a lot of the teams. So it showed a lot, of, they showed a lot of interest. And I'd go back and sometimes players would be like, oh, you want to hang out? I was like, I can't have an interview. And like, you just could feel like the disappointment disappointment in them so it kind of sucks on that level like you want everyone to win yeah, everyone exactly. to eat so that was kind of a thing for me like I enjoyed it but at the same time like I could see why people wouldn't enjoy it right. at the same time so that was a big exactly. thing and then I got invited to the draft and that was something that you dream about I guess in sports and American sports like 100% yeah yeah so I go to the draft <laughs> in Chicago have my boys come and um it was just like it was like a movie. Any after party? Oh yeah. Number thirteen. Yeah, oh yeah. I was say, come on, you gotta have a moment for that. Number thirteen, boss. That's a, yeah, that's a pretty lot good of, number. Yeah, my boys were nuts. <laughs> Chicago, oh a great city. 
So kind of what's it? I know for for a lot of people, they might not really know what an MLS draft day is like. Yeah, I know. I know they they glorify the NFL draft. They glorify the NBA draft. Yeah. The insiders that kind of walk you through where the where the players are at and mentally yeah. things like that. So what's it kind of like for you on draft day? I know you kind of said it was yeah. a, a major moment for you, but kind so of like- it was actually a real quick turnaround. So you go from the combine to the draft being in like four or five days after. So I go home, like, I, I'm like, oh, I got this many tickets to bring my family. Like, I tell my friends, oh, it's going to be in Chicago. Like, at that point, I know, like, the range I'm going to go in. Because when you're at the combine, mock drafts are coming out every day, a new mock draft. So people are stressing about that. But I you, saw you, – You already knew you were top 15. Yeah. So I was in that range of, like, 7 to 15. Like, probably wouldn't fall out of 15, probably. Hang on one second. To, not yeah. to interrupt you, but were you going on Twitter and searching up your name every five seconds with the recap? <laughs> Come on. Oh, I was, I was searching for those mock drafts. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. yeah. He, oh, yeah. He's oh, I, would search my, I would search my name, too. Like, players want to go on, on, on SportsCenter and say, oh, I, I'm not paying attention to the mock drafts. Buddy, yeah. you're on your phone. Oh, no. Page. Everyone's looking at that stuff. When your name's out there, you want to see what people have to say. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, yeah, that was, that was crazy. Um. But we uh we got like we went home for a little bit. I got a haircut, got all that that nice stuff done. Figured out my plans, and then we flew out literally the day before it. And we drove me and my boys drove all the way to New York. We met my parents took a separate flight. We drove to New York, got on the plane. It was freezing cold. We get there, or like I'm on the plane, and teams are calling me the night the night before the draft saying, oh, can we meet? Can we meet again? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, uh, the flight attendants yelling at me, like, oh, we're about to take off. Like, can you put your phone down? And I'm staying on the phone. And they keep coming back. Can you put your phone down? I'm like, no, no. Like, you man, I'm remember. about to get drafted. You, yeah. okay? you put the phone down. <laughs> but uh, we make it there late at night. And then the next day is the draft. Like, I could barely sleep. Had all my stuff laid out. It was, like, at 12, 12 o'clock it started. And they do the introduction and you're, you're just like, even if you think you know that you're going in a certain range and you know, like, oh, when it's going to happen, you're still sweating. You don't know what could happen. Like anything could happen. People could trade up, trade down. And you're just really, I was so anxious. I was just, the room was packed, filled. The commissioner starts talking and all that stuff. And uh, you hear your name called and you like second guess it. You're like, did they call me? That's you crazy. go up there and you give the speech, you hug the commissioner, take pictures, the speech, the whole, the whole thing, just like you would imagine the crowd, everything. Mm-hmm. Then you go back and then you're bombarded with the media asking questions, different questions, different pictures, a picture here, a picture there. So it's definitely like surreal and everything happens so fast. You just, you have to take a moment and try to take it in and it, it, it's hard to because... So was it, a, was it a culture shock going from like a small Connecticut town to hopping off the stage in Chicago and yeah. surrounded by the media? Oh, the- yeah, it was like I, I, I felt like I shouldn't have been there. Like, a, how did I make it there? Like a, a kid like me from this small town playing soccer, I'd, I would have never guessed that that would be the end goal. What was the moment that like you kind of woke up and you're like, holy shit, I'm a pro? <laughs> what, what Do you remember the day that that happened or was it like? <laughs> The first day of practice or uh, or what? Honestly, I'd say it was, like, right after the draft because I was, like, I couldn't breathe with all the people that were trying to get to me and do all these different things. And then when it finally settled down, one more person came up to me and was, like, all right, we need to book your flight. Like, you're going – we're training next week. And I'm, okay. like, wow. Um, I'm This is actually happening. <laughs> like – so it happened, it happened fast. I mean, you had all this preparation even going up into high school, but did it still feel like it was just fast? Like, yeah. Like, oh, my God, did it finally happen? You know? Yeah, like it just like everyone tells you, oh, your your life could change within a year, within months, and then go in a totally different direction. And like in that moment is when I realized like, wow, things do change fast. And especially totally. like you work for certain things and then they come true. It's just like it's one of the best feelings. So, Logan, we've obviously talked about your uprising in soccer, you know, how you got started, your college days. Give us a little bit of feedback or, or advice on what are you planning to do now? You know, obviously, we're in yeah. quarantine. You're, you're running around trying to, get, trying to get your workout done. What are some future aspirations and goals that you have set for yourself right now 
for the short term and long term future? I think just short term is getting back on the field and hopefully balling out and getting back up into the the first division. Ever since like I got waived from Cincinnati, like that was that was a year that for soccer was a lot more about learning the league and the business behind sports and just like all the politics behind it. And sometimes as a rookie, like you don't end up in great situations as a professional. And that was a big thing for me. So just like taking away from that and never really wanting to go back on that path and making those mistakes are just like, sometimes you can't control it. So one of the biggest things I took away from that year that someone told me is like, just control what you can control. And that, that's like the biggest thing for me is just trying to stick to that ball out this year. And like the plan is like, I came here to try to get more minutes and get more experience and try and go back up to the next level. So the end goal is to go back up into the next level. And then hopefully I go to a team where it's a better situation. The coaches aren't changing. We won't have three coaches in one year. We, so the management won't be changing. I want just more stability in the future get back up to the next level and then continue on from there, hopefully end up overseas as the end goal and obviously make as much money as you can. So just to close it out, uh, you know, give some advice for someone maybe that's in Connecticut or someone that's mm -hmm. in a small town who's aspiring to be an athlete, but, you know, doesn't see that path because their town is not a hotbed for, you know, football yeah. or their hot town is not a hotbed for soccer. What would you tell that kid in order to keep going, in order to play at Wake Forest and, you know, in order to play major league soccer in the United yeah. States? I would say mostly like do your research, listen to the people around you that know what they're talking about. Um, like, but do your research, know what academies are the best, what, what high school soccer will do for you. Cause high school soccer at one point was good, but now it's not, you're not going to see division one coaches in an area where we were from going to watch college or high school soccer, go to those prep schools if you want, or go to those academies. Like there's MLS academies, do your research on that. And just stick with it. Like, even if you are from a small town, from nothing, there's people out there that make it. And there's talent out there. You can't knock your own talent. Like, you can, it's God-given. And just when you want something, go out and reach for it. Like, you might have to sacrifice a lot when you're from a small town because you might have to go out of your way. You might have to drive two hours. But, like, you hear a lot of those stories and you hear a lot of them working out because in the long run, it could, it could really work out. And, even if you don't make it all the way to the next level, college is just as good, whether it's D1, D2, D3. Set your goals high, but don't be ashamed if you don't reach those ultimate goals because the sports can take you a long way, whether it's to the next level where you're getting paid to do it for fun or if you get a free education. Like, no matter what, it's just work, work your way there. And like you said, like you said, even if you're in a small place in a little small pool, yeah. Talent and ambition can get you a long way. Hell of a long way. Hell of a long way. Look so, I you. appreciate your time for the viewers appreciate out there. Where can we find you on social media? Uh you can on Instagram, hit the gram. Uh Logan Gadula. <laughs> just that. Literally just that. Just that. I'm gonna hit you if I slide down to Charleston. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Well, I and did then, that uh, patio bar, you already know. Oh yeah. <laughs> And likes to have maybe, fun. We already know. Maybe, the, that. maybe the club, too. Maybe. Yeah, we all get yeah. the club. But I, I'll tell you what, I damn sure ain't running with you. I ain't doing nothing. <laughs> else, no running. I ain't doing none of that shit. The day after, we got to run it out. We got to sweat it out, you know? No, no, you got to run it out, <laughs> Mr. Corona. I'm not running with you. We're not even sharing the same bottle. Fuck that. <laughs> You're going to you be the only cup one. whole night. We put your name on the cup. You're going to be the only one down here wearing a mask. <laughs> You're going to be that guy. You're going to be that guy. <laughs> That's crazy. I'm that guy down there. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, uh, brother, thanks for coming on. This has All been right. another episode of V Smack Talk Podcast. I'm JR Sports Media, and it's just like.